Hello there, listeners, and welcome back. My name is Stephanie Safarian, and you're listening to episode 341 of Sustainable Minimalists. On today's show, I am speaking to those of you who feel overwhelmed with minimalism. I have seven thoughts for you today. And I wanted to do this episode today because maybe you saw Marie Kondo is again making headlines. She recently was interviewed by the Washington Post and she said, and I quote, up until now, I was a professional tidier, so I did my best to keep my home tidy at all times. I have kind of given up on that in a good way for me. Now I realize what's important to me is enjoying spending time with my children at home. End quote. Since Marie Kondo said these jaw-dropping words, countless media organizations have picked up on it and given their own spins. Some commentators argue that essentially the tidy life has a downside, which is, of course, that when you're hyper-focused on tidiness, you're actually losing important free time. And that's because tidiness requires constant vigilance. Every small decision comes at the expense of something else. It sounds like that's what Marie Kondo is best saying in her interview with the Washington Post. And so this episode is for those of you listening who are like Marie Kondo. Perhaps you are tired of the constant vigilance Perhaps you're overwhelmed by the stresses associated with being a minimalist. If you feel as though minimalism is not helping you, it's taking more than it gives, you don't have time for tidying, this is the episode in which I'm speaking directly to you. I have seven things to say today, and the first one is let's not blame minimalism. Let's take a beat. Let's step back. Oftentimes, I've noticed that minimalism tends to get a bad rap. But that's because the general public uses confusing terms in the wrong ways. It's oftentimes the decluttering and the organizing and the tidying that's to blame for the overwhelm. I argue that minimalism is not the problem. Minimalism is part of the solution, but we'll get there in a minute. Stay with me for a moment because there are notable differences between all of these terms that are floating around in the ether and breaking them down is really important. So Quick reminder for some of you, but maybe this will be a jaw-dropping moment for new listeners. Decluttering is an action. It is the act of removing items from your home that no longer fit in the season of life you're currently living. Organizing, another action. It's the act of creating systems for the stuff you've decided to keep. We each have different organizing personalities, if you will. Cassandra Arson, aka Clutterbug, she spoke to this quite well when she was on the show. That was episode 152, I believe, if you missed it. I'll link to it in the show notes. But are you a strict organizer in which there's organization systems for your organization system? So systems within a system? Or are you more lax? As in, if it's in a closet and the closet door is shut, you're good. <laughs> Here's an example of what I'm talking about. In your closet where you keep your clothes, do you organize your hanged clothes by color or is it good enough that your clothes are all simply hung up? Here's another example for those of us with children. When it comes to your children's art stuff, do you encourage your children to separate the markers from their crayons, from their colored pencils, each within their own vessels? Or is one big box or basket full of coloring supplies good enough? Can the markers be with the colored pencils or no? There's no one-size-fits-all organizational system. Our personalities really do come into play here. But my point is that organizing mistakes can and will make overwhelm worse. And then finally, we got tidying. Tidying, another action, my friends. It is the act of putting misplaced items back into the organizational system you created. Okay, so we're all set on what decluttering, organizing, and tidying are, and they do go in that order. What then is minimalism? Minimalism is not an action. It's an umbrella lifestyle. It's an umbrella under which decluttering, organizing, tidying, and a host of all other actions fall. Again, minimalism is not an action. It's a mindset we take with us as we move through the world. 
It's a mindset in which we believe in our heart of hearts that living better means living with less, precisely because when you live with less, you don't have to waste your time constantly decluttering, organizing, and tidying. Sometimes we and the general public, we confuse minimalism with just decluttering, or we think minimalism is synonymous with a tidy house. But that's not the case. If you're feeling overwhelmed, first of all, that's normal, and we will get to that in a minute, but don't be quick to throw in the towel on minimalism, because minimalism is not what's causing the overwhelm. It's the decluttering, organizing, and tidying that's likely causing the overwhelm. Marie Kondo is not a minimalist. She does not describe herself as such. Certified KonMari consultants. These are the people who are trained in Marie Kondo's signature method. They do not market themselves as minimalists. They market themselves instead as, and I quote, professional tidying experts. Okay, so that brings me to point number two of seven, and that is at the outset, and of course, throughout your minimalist journey, it's so important to rein in your expectations. I still have to do this myself. I'm eight years into this journey. Rein in your expectations. Minimalism is great. It can be life-changing. It certainly was for me. I would not be doing this podcast if it didn't change my life for the better. But minimalism is not a magic pill that will, with the snap of your fingers, make all the stresses associated with being a living and breathing human melt away, right? We are often told in minimalist circles by minimalist influencers that if we just do a whole house declutter, our lives will transform. I argue that doing a whole house declutter will certainly help. It will majorly help even, but it is not going to fix every single problem you encounter. There is no magic pill that does that, that I know of. If you know of it, let me know. I'm ready to take it. But there's no magic pill that's going to take all our problems away. You're still going to have to clean your house. You're still going to have to put the things away, aka tidy. You're still going to feel incessant exhaustion, especially if you have children. And taking this a step further, the potential for clutter to accumulate will always be present. Decluttering, organizing, tidying, these are not one and done actions. You got to do them every day, constantly, for the rest of your life until you move on to whatever comes next. But remember, let's go back to my first point. Minimalism is not the problem. Life is the problem. (laughs) Living is what's causing the overwhelm. So if you're the adult in your home who's the default parent, who's in charge of keeping the children not just alive, not just alive, which is hard enough, but happy and thriving, If you're the person who's cooking the meals, who's cleaning the house, who's doing the errands, who's generating an income, this is too much of a load for one person to bear. Don't blame minimalism. You can blame societal expectations. You can blame gender roles. You can blame America's child care deserts, as I recently heard them called. You can blame our government's abysmal social safety net programs. But I don't think it would be right to blame minimalism. Minimalism can help if you let it. Okay, so let's go on to Stephanie's soapbox moment number three, which is that if you're feeling overwhelmed, I suggest you have simple, keyword simple organizational strategies that do not take a lot of effort to maintain. Okay, I got to talk about my husband for a minute. I love you, husband. He has organizational systems within his organizational systems. This sounds great, right? He is hyper-organized. The problem is he does not have the time or the extra energy needed to maintain his systems within their systems. Now, I have an example for you because this is confusing. My husband tends to be the person who's in charge of filing away the bills, the tax papers, all of the paper clutter, okay? We have a filing cabinet, which is an organizational system in its own right. But within the cabinet, he has tabs for every year. And then within every year, he has separate folders for every bill. 2023's electric bills have a folder. 2023's cell phone bills 
have a folder, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and on and on and on and on. I would argue that this is a complex system. When it's maintained, it works wonderfully. If I need March of 2021 cell phone bill, I can have it in my hot little hand, in theory, in 30 seconds or less, right? But because he doesn't have the time to actually maintain the complex system he created, here's what happens. All these papers pile up in a gigantic heap on top of our filing cabinet. This is a major eyesore, by the way. It's also an example of an organizational system failure. If it's too difficult to maintain the system, then you need to simplify your system. Instead of having separate folders for each and every bill, why not have just one big folder for all the 2023 papers? That would be an example of simplifying your system. Now, if you have children, make sure the organizational systems you created are easy for their developing brains to maintain. If the systems you created are too complex, The responsibility of tidying up the kids' toys is going to fall on you each and every day. I say this with love. I say it with love. But it is not your children's fault that they cannot maintain your system. They're kids. If the kids can't maintain the system, the fault, I say this with love, lies on your shoulders. You got to simplify the systems for them. So instead of expecting your young children to separate their magna tiles from their wooden blocks, let's say, why not just have one bin or one basket that's reserved for all the blocks, all the building block materials? Yeah, magna tiles are different than wooden blocks, but It's simplified for young brains. And when it's simplified for young brains, the chances that you're going to have to be the one separating the magnet tiles from the wooden blocks, the probability of that happening shrinks. Okay, so that's number three. Let's move on to number four. If you're feeling overwhelmed, a tip for you that I use every single day, not just in my home, but in my life, is to just eat the frog. (laughs) Now, if you've been listening for a while, you already know that Mark Twain has provided me with one of my favorite quotes of all time. And I'm going to say it again for listeners who are new or who might have missed it. The quote is, thank you, Mark Twain, quote, if it's your job to eat the frog, it's best to do it first thing in the morning. And if it's your job to eat two frogs, it's best to eat the biggest one first. Oh my goodness. What is Stephanie talking about? Why are we eating frogs? What's going on? We're not talking about frogs. We're talking about completing tasks that we don't want to do. The fear of starting a job that we don't want to do is always worse than the job itself. We as humans, we have a tendency to build up events and tasks and chores into momentous occasions. Good events, positive events, we build them up to unrealistic expectations we tend to. Negative events like major decluttering tasks, like tidying up, like tackling the pile of papers that are sitting on top of my filing cabinet, we tend to exaggerate the negative aspects of these tasks so greatly that we fear ever starting. This is where Mark Twain's wisdom comes into play. Rolling up your sleeves and getting it done, whatever the negative task is that you've been dreading, Even better, getting it done first thing in the morning so it doesn't weigh on you all day is always easier than stewing amidst the exaggerated negativity you've created in your mind. Okay, so on this show, we're talking about tidying up the house, right? Maintaining your organizational systems. However, eating the frog is timeless wisdom that can be used for anything in your life that you don't want to do. Let's use exercise for the example. So many of us hate exercising. If you know you got to exercise or you know you got to make a tough phone call and it's just dreading, you're just dreading it, it's weighing on you, it's in the back of your mind, it's creating stress and anxiety, you feel it in your gut, you don't want to do it, you don't want to do it, you're wasting so much mental energy, just get it done. Just do it. Just do whatever the thing is that you're avoiding. Get it done so you can move on with your day. 
I like to think of my daily tasks as bowling pins. I don't know why bowling pins come to mind, but the long skinny candlestick ones, right? I line them up and I knock them down one by one. I definitely knock the ones that I don't want to knock down first, simply because it eases my mental load. I don't do the dreaded tasks first to be a hero or a martyr by any means. I do them first because it makes my life easier. So if tidying, cleaning, organizing, if these daily actions that we have to do because we're alive stress you out, I suggest, number one, to remember you have to do them. And number two, because we have to do them, get them done first so that you can move on with a lightened load throughout your day. All right, we're going to take a quick ad break. I have more tips for you when we come back. When we come back, we're going to talk about glorious pockets of free time. I'll see you in a minute. Here's something you might never have thought about. Why on earth does laundry detergent come in those massive plastic jugs? Who wants that thing? They're inconvenient and awkward and heavy, and the detergent inside, it's up to 90% water. That's right, we're paying for water. My Earth Breeze laundry detergent eco sheets look like dryer sheets, but they're not. They dissolve in any wash cycle, hot or cold, and it couldn't be easier. There's no measuring the goo. You just toss them in. No plastic jug to be found here. I love that Earth Breeze's formula actually cleans my clothes because ain't nobody has time to do laundry twice, right? Now is the time to try Earth Breeze because right now, my listeners can subscribe and get 40% off. Go to earthbreeze.com slash sustainable to get started. That's earthbreeze.com slash sustainable for 40% off. earthbreeze.com slash sustainable. Thrive Market is my go-to for all of those grocery items that stock my pantry. Just yesterday, I ordered my favorites, Siete Tortilla Chips, Primal Kitchen's sugar-free pizza sauce for my family's Friday pizza nights, my guilty pleasure, which is, of course, organic chocolate-covered hazelnuts that I don't share with anybody ever. Thrive Market has over 70 filters on their website and app, so whether you're looking for a certified gluten-free or non-toxic, you can curate your own shopping experience with the literal click of a button. Join Thrive Market today and get 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift. Go to thrivemarket.com slash sustainable for 30% off your order plus a free $60 gift. That's T-H-R-I-V-E market.com slash sustainable, thrivemarket.com slash sustainable. If you're not sleeping on bed sheets with viscose from bamboo yet, what on earth are you waiting for? I used to be a cotton bed sheets type of girl, and then I tried Caraloha's soft and sustainable bedding made from viscose from bamboo. You guys, the difference is huge. It is one of the softest and comfiest fabrics on the planet. They're also cooler. Viscose from bamboo fabrics are three degrees cooler than non-bamboo fabrics, and they're naturally moisture wicking, which means they're lightweight and breathable. And even my husband, who, let's be real, he generally does not care too much about our bed sheets, but even he prefers our Caraloha sheets over our humdrum cotton ones. Caraloha is giving our listeners 25% off their order by using code SUSTAINABLE. The code does not last forever, so hurry and head to C-A-R-I-L-O-H-A dot com and use code SUSTAINABLE to receive 25% off your order. And we're back on today's show. We're discussing what to do when you feel overwhelmed with minimalism. Before the break, let's just recap. I had four tips for you, I believe it was. Yes, four. Uh, Tip number one was to not blame minimalism. Minimalism is not the problem. Living is the problem. (laughs) Tip two was to rein in your minimalism expectations. Minimalism is great, but it's not a magic pill to solve all your problems. Number three was to hone in on simple organizational strategies that do not take a lot of effort to maintain. And my fourth tip for you is to just eat the frog. Just do what you don't want to do first. Just get it done so you can move on and enjoy your day. Tip number five is to take advantage 
of those glorious pockets of free time that just happen to pop up. There will be pockets of time in which you find yourself with free time and extra mental space. I promise you this. And I also promise you that these elusive pockets of free time will increase in frequency as your children get a bit older. If you are listening to me right now, if you're listening right now and you have babies or toddlers, I am not speaking to you with this tip. You are in the trenches, my friend. Your goal is not to have a tidy home. Your goal is to survive. I promise you there is life on the other side of raising babies and toddlers, and you too will get there. I was thinking just the other day about what my life was like when my two daughters were younger and how truly hard it was. Gosh, it was hard. But I feel confident in saying that I'm on the other side now. Both my children are in elementary school. And so I can say to you then with confidence that you too will get there one day at a time. And by the way, when we talk about survival mode, I'm not just speaking to the parents with young children. I am speaking to any and all of you who are managing a crisis. Maybe you've had a death in your family or a disheartening medical diagnosis or a job loss or some other sort of family upheaval. That's survival mode. And if you're in it, maintaining your minimalist home can and should Go to the back burner. It's not your priority right now. But rest assured, your season of life will change. Change is life's only true constant. With this tip, I am speaking to those of us who are fortunate enough to experience glorious pockets of free time. If you find yourself with a glorious pocket of free time, that's when you tackle a neglected drawer or medicine cabinet or linen closet or some other area in your home that's been a hot mess for a long while. Some people call this spring cleaning. And spring cleaning refers to that deep decluttering and tidying and organizing that some of us do once a year. I don't call it spring cleaning. I call it home maintenance. And it doesn't have to be done all at once in some gigantic, expansive energy. It does not have to be done in the spring. I, just the other day, found myself with a glorious pocket of free time. It was about 10 minutes of quiet before I had to go pick up my daughters from the bus stop. It was not enough time for me to open my novel and read. It was not enough time to get any meaningful work done for the podcast. It was not enough time to tackle a big mess in my home, but it was enough time for me to clean a few drawers in my kitchen. You know how crumbs just somehow accumulate in the kitchen drawers? gross, right? 10 minutes was the perfect amount of time for me to take out the vacuum, suck up the crumbs in the crummiest of my drawers, and then go on with my day. And you know what? Can I just say, every time I open those newly crumb-free and clean drawers, a wave of peace rolls over me, which brings me to point number six, my next point. Remember that responsible decluttering and creating organizational systems that work for your family and tidying a little bit every single day, these are acts of self-care. They're also acts of service for your future self, for your tomorrow self. You are not tidying so that you can have the most beautiful home on the block. And if that's your motivation for being a minimalist, we need to chat. I say that with love, but we got to we got to talk. We are minimalists so that we can best free up precious mental space. We declutter so we have more free time to spend with our family. We create routines around organization so our homes quietly hum along and function. It's not so much about aesthetics. It's about making your life easier. And again, minimalism can do that for you if you let it. Okay, now let's talk about self-care for a moment. I am boldly going off on a tangent. And just stay with me. If you love Stephanie's stories, I hope you'll like this one. I recently learned something about myself. And here it is. Get ready. I do not allow enough time for myself to rest and rejuvenate. I tend to rest only when the work is done, the professional work, the work in my home. The problem is that the work is rarely done, so I rarely rest. Now, there, of course, are consequences to me 
always working, (laughs) not resting, not giving myself the self-care I desperately need. And if I'm honest, I frankly deserve. It's a recipe for disaster. Let me just tell you, I get cranky. I feel the compulsion to resort to wine. And I also feel compulsions to resort to drastic measures. Okay, so what's a drastic measure? We know what being cranky is. We know what reaching for wine looks like. But what's a drastic measure? Well, in my life, a drastic measure looks like acting on emotion and not acting with intention. In my professional life, as the host and owner of this podcast, drastic measures mean just abandoning the whole thing, giving up, throwing in the towel, being done with it. I'm sick of it. I hate it. I don't. I'm not sick of it. And I'm not hate it. But in those moments, that's what shows up for me. In the home, drastic measures show up as a compulsion to grab a trash bag and walk around the house and throw everything out. Yes, this goes against everything I preach on this show. And no, I don't do it. The point here is that I have the compulsion to do it. And when I'm overwhelmed and when I've neglected my own self-care, this compulsion to throw everything out is what shows up for me. I do think that's normal, by the way. So if you feel that way, it's normal. It's okay. We're human. We can feel that way sometimes. So here's what I'm working on in my life. I am working on taking these cues, which are, again, getting cranky, reaching for wine, and feeling the compulsion to resort to drastic measures, I'm taking these cues and I'm working on not shaming myself. I'm working on not falling into a pit of resentment and overwhelm and instead taking these cues as feedback. That's all it is, simple feedback. Feedback that I'm not giving myself what I need throughout my days. That's the tangent. So let me align my tangent that I just went off on with my point. Taking care of your living space is taking care of yourself. Yes, it is self-care. But self-care is also taking care of all the other parts and pieces that together make you who you are. Some days pop up and we just don't have time for self-care. That is the unfortunate part about carrying the weight of our families on our shoulders. But I do believe that when we take a more holistic approach to living, when we care for all of our parts, we are more able to manage the just one part of ourselves that we're discussing today, which is the state of our homes. If the state of your home is stressing you out, it could just mean that your home is stressing you out. Or it could mean that something else is coming up for you. It could mean that you're neglecting other parts of your whole self. So next time your home stresses you out, I suggest you ask yourself, what's showing up inside? Is it the mess or is it something bigger than the mess? For me, it always tends to be something bigger, something deeper. And maybe it is for you as well. That brings me to point number seven, my seventh and final point, which is, to above all and always give yourself grace and compassion. Remember that minimalism, the lifestyle of minimalism, it is an umbrella. And when we talk about the umbrella that is minimalism, living with less, living with intention, living in a way that's focused less on stuff, minimalism is a countercultural umbrella that we're holding in our hot little hands. And being countercultural takes an awful lot of energy and grit and perseverance. I like to think of being a minimalist as swimming upstream. So picture it in your mind for a minute. You are in a river and you are swimming and the current is pushing you south, but you want to go north. So you're swimming against the current. You can and you likely will get tired if you're not already. You can and likely will at times want to give up, especially when you see that dozens of other people, including your friends and your family, are swimming in the opposite direction. Your friends and family are on floaties. They've got cocktails in their hands. They are having the time of their lives letting the current take them wherever the current wants to go. In these moments of emotional and mental fatigue, I suggest that instead of giving up and following your friends and family and all the other people with their cocktails on their floaties, and instead of swimming harder and faster upstream, 
choose the option in the middle. I suggest you remember that you can and should get out of the river for a minute. You can and should take a break. You can sit on the banks of the river for a hot minute or two or three or five or ten and rest. You are doing great things. Everyone who swims by you going downstream, they're watching you. They are silently marveling at your determination. They are wondering what is so great upstream that you're willing to put in the extra effort to get there. You are changing lives by going against the grain, even if you can't see it as you're struggling to stay afloat. So get out of the river for a minute. Sit on the banks. In minimalism, there are no rules. The rules don't matter. The rules are made up. (laughs) What does matter is your determination to keep swimming in the direction that you have already internally decided is the right direction for you. So give yourself grace and compassion. What you're doing is really darn hard and you deserve to get out, sit on the banks, marvel at how far you've come and give yourself a pat on the back. Okay, so I have an eco tip for you, but before I give you my eco tip, I would like to just say really quickly, if you love the show and you haven't left it a review yet, please consider doing so. That would make me the happiest podcast host you know. I should also say too, I know how many of you listen each week and I know how many reviews the show has. If the numbers are correct, less than 8% of you have actually left a review. So the other 92% of you, if you listen on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, please take 60 seconds out of your day. Leave the show a quick review. Leave all your favorite shows quick reviews. Thank you so, so much. All right, my eco tip for you is from me. It's another Stephanie eco tip, and it's because we are bringing the eco tips back. As I mentioned on a previous episode, we're bringing them back. And also, by the way, if you have an eco tip, make sure to send it to me because I will run out of personal eco tips myself. So I'm relying on all of you to keep the eco tips going. My eco tip for you, again, is a story. Around Christmas, well, first of all, both my daughters are really into gymnastics. And for Christmas, they wanted a gymnastics tumbling mat for our basement. And I thought about it. My husband thought about it. We thought to ourselves, well, yeah, I mean, that could be a good gift. Get them moving. You know, it's an active gift. And then I thought to myself, well, wait a minute. We just replaced our mattress. Yes, we did. Why not instead just put our mattress in the basement instead of giving it away or decluttering it or throwing it out, which is what generally happens to mattresses, why not put it in the basement? And instead of purchasing a new tumbling mat, why can't they just tumble on the mattress? Okay, so we tried it. We put our mattress in the basement, repurposed it into a tumbling mat for my daughters, and oh my goodness, The fun they are having. Weeks upon weeks upon weeks of fun they're having. We didn't give them our old mattress as a Christmas present. Don't don't think that. But we did put it in the basement. This mattress has allowed them to do all sorts of tumbling, jumping, all the things. And they are quite happy. So if you have children who like to tumble, who like to do handstands and cartwheels and all the things... Do you have couch cushions or a futon mattress or a mattress on a bed that you're not using? Or does somebody in your family, are they giving away a mattress that you can acquire and put it down on some flat surface? Trust me, you will not be disappointed. Your children will have the time of their lives. So that's my eco tip for you. We will see you on Tuesday. We we are discussing quitting. Yes, we're talking about quitting how to know when it's time to quit something, how to strategically quit, all of that we are discussing on Tuesday. I will see you then. Thank you so much for listening and take care.